And if the others can mute your microphones, please. Yeah, on mic. Yeah. Excellent. All right, so well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lockie Scott. I'm a defense scientist with Defense R&D Canada, Ottawa, and I work in the area of space situational awareness, uh, primarily using the NEOSAT microsatellite and some ground-based optical instruments that Canada's manufactured for the Department of National Defense. Uh, the Canadian Aeronautics and Space Institute is pleased to present this space situational awareness technical session, featuring presentations from Canadian and international presenters uh, dealing with a very complex field of space domain awareness, um, which is a complex and evolving field, as we've seen this week, things change quite rapidly and sometimes unexpectedly. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to remind everyone, for those of you who are online, uh, please mute your microphone if you're not speaking, and make sure you're, uh, uh, to make sure that we cut down any excess noise while we are, uh, while we're presenting. For the audience, uh, there is a chat box on the right side of your screen. Um, it's uh, kind of hidden a little bit, but on the right side of your screen, there's a little there's a little chat uh, application that you can uh, place your questions to the presenters there, and I will be asking the questions on your behalf to the presenters uh, during the uh, during the presentation. So, without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, which is Stefan Kuntz from Airbus uh, Airbus uh, Space and Defense, and he will be presenting us a presentation on. Uh, just one second here, just bring up the right. Airbus activities on space situational awareness and space domain awareness. So, Stefan, if you'd like to share your screen, we're pleased to have you as your first, our first presenter today. Okay, so do you see my screen? Uh, not yet. So, can you see it now? Yep, screen's coming in, and go to presentation mode, and that should bring it up for us. Okay, can you see it? Looks good on our side. Please carry, please carry on. Okay, so my name is Stefan Kunz. I'm working for Airbus here uh, in Friedrichshafen, Germany, which is on the very south of Germany, close to the Swiss and uh, Austria border. My background, very long ago I studied forestry, and then I was involved quite early in my studies with uh, digital image processing, which at that time, in the early 80s, was uh, quite... Uh, Challenging, I would say. Um, then, uh, after 10 years being at the university, I thought I need to uh, change, and uh, then I went to industry. And now, since 2002, I'm working for Astrum, now it's uh, Airbus, and I'm in the department for future programs, mainly working on new future missions, but also on space situation awareness activities. So, the, there is a real big challenge to generate a recognized space picture uh, from mission obje objectives to a fully uh, fledged system. And very important at the beginning is uh, to simply know what are the goals for a recognized space uh, system uh, and, and what are the use cases, what are the capabilities. It's also important what should be excluded from, from the uh, regular space picture. Um, well, the question is, can we use owner sets? Is it national? Will we rely on external services? Which performance uh, shall be expected in, in LEO, MEO, or GEO orbits? And the goals finally define the requirements, and, and this in the end is, is put into the system design. And of course, we have to differentiate between military or dual use examples and uh, civil examples. So security in space is uh, an important topic here at Abbas and uh, during the last 15 years we have gained a lot of experience based on studies and projects for ESA, for the European Commission, for national customers, for military, for NATO, but also we have invested own money to develop uh, certain elements to be really uh, on, on the top of um, developments. Our topics quite broad, starting from threat detection, protection of space assets, and a more and more important uh, issue. Uh, as I say, system architecture, networking, space-based sensor design, ground-based sensor design, 
data processing, and also then delivery of uh, space situational awareness products and services. If we look into the system architecture, it's uh, also quite complex. It starts with uh, ground-based uh, surveying technologies, space-based uh, based, uh, situation awareness uh, activities, additional sensors from radar, passive, LIDAR, and also very important partnerships. And from, let's say, all these data which come in from the many different sources, we have to look into the data processing system, which is based on some backbone elements, then on, mainly on the catalog, from the catalog doing all the processing which is needed, and finally dissemination to the customers, which could be uh, from a large variety, military, national, uh, also uh, large entities such as ESA, and of course, the very important also is always the exchange to uh, and access to other sources to create a comprehensive uh, picture. Now, being a little bit more concrete, a few ideas about space-based uh, sensors, which are mainly uh, supporting military activities, especially uh, securing military assets in space. Um, and of course, uh, from space, you have a unique strategy for observations, in whether independent, high availability, all time. Um, also, there is this enhanced performance and uh, in timeless and also revisit. And definitely, it offers new possibilities which are not available from ground. Um, nevertheless, you have to differentiate between surveillance and reconnaissance, because both elements require different missions. So uh, surveillance and tracking is detection and cataloging of space objects and characterizations, for instance, from light tourist maneuver detection or neighborhood watch. And then space-based reconnaissance uh, aims to really identify a, a specific object. Um, and uh, it's also very important for neighborhood watching uh, there have been examples in the past where uh, satellites were visiting other satellites and uh, really not all, always for good reasons. So, of course, you can select different orbits. One is uh, looking from the geo to do imaging and reconnaissance. And, of course, there are a lot of possibilities. Uh, with a very high resolution to really identify uh, specific objects until to just detections that, that something is there and it simply is a matter of the resolution you are uh, taking. And uh, so, so one idea is to equip satellites with such uh, narrow field sensors or really have dedicated missions monitoring from GEOs or NEOs specific uh, satellites. And uh, if you look into uh, surveillance, we are not looking into, let's say, dedicated small objects, but we're looking over large areas, and the larger the better, still having a resolution which is capable to detect uh, objects and also especially um, debris. Normally, these uh, space or range, uh, satellites are microsatellites with uh, about 150 kilograms, while, let's say, the, the surveillance satellites are normally bigger. Um, for, the, for the development of such uh, space missions, we had several studies. Um, where also we developed some uh, breadboard hardware to, to really test end-to-end -end observation and processing um, and uh, also to, to generate characteristic space debris scenes. Uh, and uh, on the next side, you just see the, the breadboard, which uh, is quite uh, large, and you can imagine that uh, it was quite an effort to build it up. 
Another element um, is uh, ground-based surveillance. And uh, for maybe for research and testing reasons, we also have established an own uh, uh, telescope. It's, it's called ART, Airbus Robotic Telescope, which uh, uh, it was deployed in 2018. It uh, performs automated op uh, optical observations uh, of space objects from LEO to GEO. And it's uh, a real test bed uh, of a future space-based optical system, um, especially to really understand fully what is needed to process and how in a highly automated way uh, the, the identification of objects and the tracking of objects. Um, with this uh, instrument, we're, we're participating in measurement campaigns on national level, on ESA level, uh, level on NATO level, and uh, it's it's a major uh, input for a lot of our uh, R&D activities. They, by the way, this uh, telescope is uh, located in Spain. We, of course, cannot do everything, so there, a very important element is also cooperation with uh, other commercial providers, and uh, Leo Labs is a very good uh, example, as uh, we, we invested uh, in an venture capital into this uh, company. They are operating the radars on ground, and uh, can detect objects up to 10 centimeters and have uh, uh, can track more than 10,000 Leo objects from public catalogs. Um, they have uh, located uh, those uh, radars in different uh, parts of the world, and the target performance is uh, two centimeters, which will then end in a catalog of 250,000 objects. Uh, very important again is really cooperation with uh, commercial SSA data providers. And uh, just recently, we carried out a study for the German Armed Forces, which was uh, looking into uh, capabilities of uh, global SSA data providers for the space situation awareness, especially for the means for the German Armed Forces. You know, they are also operating own satellites. Um, they are fully aware that uh, they will not be able to have a fully fledged, fully operational ground-based surveying system globally working. So they are looking really to for support of uh, industry. And uh, here in, in the framework of this study, we have approached, uh, I, I think, all of the big players uh, globally together, of course, with the public available data to come up with a proposal for a comprehensive uh, surveying system. Of, nowadays, also, the let's say the, the situation in space is rapidly moving. Everybody knows that we have much more smaller uh, satellites, which, uh, let's say, makes it much more tricky to have uh, uh, the detection and correlation there will be lots of satellites in clusters, also in, in geo-orbit. Um, many of these satellites are very small microsatellites, not with, let's say, standard space uh, uh, certified equipment, which simply means there is a big risk that uh, many of these satellites uh, will have failures, which then increase the, the amount of waste which which makes the situation for other satellites even more complex and this is an issue which is very intensively discussed on, on international level we have all electric satellites um, we have evolving space threats so uh, especially um, monitoring the neighborhood with respect to it detect on on orbit stalkers or, or servicing things and very important is, of course, you need to detect these issues. You need to identify the threat and the potential risk, and then to characterize it um, and, and take uh, respective uh, measures. 
Very important, of course, uh, if we go into the requirements of processing more data, more objects, uh, we have to look into highly automated processes, and uh, especially uh, our experience from, from uh, the R telescope is, is used to uh, really try to automate uh, such uh, data streams, to have also uh, autonomous payloads, which uh, in orbit, which do a lot of, uh, uh, not only the classical uh, orbit determination and cataloging, conjunction or reentry alerts, but also characterizing object capabilities, and uh, really try to fuse and evaluate large data sets coming from different sources, from space, from ground, um, and, and bring everything together towards a comprehensive service. So uh, for that, we also have uh, created a digital test bed, which uh, is um, capable to uh, integrate ground-based and space-based sensors. It can integrate radar and optical. It, uh, it uses standard data formats for um, input and output. And it's uh, permanently um, developed further to really be able to um, be ready for, for the next uh, generation of satellites and also for the new coming uh, challenges which are ahead of us. With this, uh, I can close my presentation. Thanks a lot for uh, your attention. And uh, yeah, if there are any questions, please uh, ask. Thank you very much. Well, that was very well done and very interesting presentation. And you seem to have a very comprehensive set of offerings that Airbus is putting together right now. Um, I don't see any questions in the uh, chat box right now. I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll lead off with a couple myself here. And maybe in the meantime, the audience can drop some uh, questions in the chat for you if uh, you would like. So I guess. Um, I guess one question I just wanted, the kind of thing that jumped out at me, I've been, we've been running a small microsatellite for tracking small objects in LEO for, well, since 2013 right now. And I noticed uh, a reference to one millimeter sized objects that would be detected by the proposed microsatellite there. I was just curious about the strategy that one would use to do that. Um, there was a pretty, to detect those small objects, especially when they're traveling at 1,000 or 10,000 arc seconds per second. It's a very technically sophisticated and challenging thing to do. So I was just curious about what the strategy is to handle that. <laughs> Good question. I think it's a challenge for every uh, satellite operator uh, how to deal with these micro base particles. Um, so. Uh, also, ESA is, is looking into that direction, and uh, I think the international concern is, is really uh, rising. And uh, here at, at Airbus, we're also looking into, let's say, sp dedicated satellites, which, which can remove the waste. There are different ideas currently, uh, but uh, I think that the very small particles will be a real challenge. And, um, but the situation will get worse in, in the next decades. Uh, we, we just got also the information that uh, from ESA that, uh, for instance, uh, they were calculating five to, to eight um, orbit changes per year in the past. Now they are, are calculating up to 15 uh, orbit changes per year simply because uh, the, the, the waste, uh, the amount of waste is increasing. But uh, at the moment, nobody has a real good idea about these micro uh, particles. Uh, that's a fair point. The um, part of my curiosity was how to sense them uh, from, from a microsatellite platform, just because the angular velocities are very high. Um, but uh, I guess there's one question from the audience I would like to um, uh, push or go towards right now. Um, so the question from Dave Siddharth is, uh, what do you think is the greatest challenge in tracking the sheer number of objects about to go, go into orbit in the next decade? Think mega constellations and so forth. What would you say are the biggest challenges to do that, to achieve the goal of understanding the situation out there? Let's see if we make a life really tricky. <laughs> Just to put it as that. Um, for, especially for dedicated orbits, um, 
all these small sets. Uh, as I said, the, most of them are not uh, uh, are built very cheap without space qualified components, which will mean many of them will die in a re relatively short time frame and they will add to uh, the, the, the problem of yeah, polluted space. Um, and I think uh, the, the only way around is to, to look into international regulations, which will force also these uh, many uh, small satellite uh, operators to, to really remove or find a way to remove uh, these small sets uh, in, a, in a certain time frame out of the orbits without um, creating additional um, uh, waste. Uh, but I, I think uh, the big challenge, as I said, is uh, that the more orbits we need to, to monitor, the more demanding also processing capabilities will become. Um, and of course, we have to rely on many different sources from space, from ground. And uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the capacity is needed to monitor all these objects and really identify potential threats to to uh, assets in space, uh, this is a, a, a big challenge. But I also believe it's a big market. So b both, it's, 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 uh, it has pros and cons. So for those companies who come up with good ideas how to monitor that, raise early warnings uh, to, to customers, I think uh, they, they are more, more needed than ever. That's very true, and I'm um, very curious to see what the offerings are going to be in the coming years here. I'd like to thank you for, uh, on behalf of uh, Cassie today for your presentation. And um, just to stay on schedule here, we're going to proceed on to the next um, uh, presenter. Uh, but please well, please uh, thank uh, Stefan for his presentation today. Our next presenter is Clive Oates, and he is also from Airbus Defense and Space. And his uh, talk is titled Low Cost Small Satellites for SSA and Space uh, Domain Awareness. So, Clive, uh, please feel free to take control. Hi there, can you hear me okay? Yeah, audio is fine. Okay, good. Under the screen button, there's an option. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So, um, can you see that okay? It's coming in clear on the side. Please. Okay. Uh, there you go. Perfect. Um, yeah, good, good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Clive Oates, uh, and I'm actually head of region Five Eyes Nations in, in Surrey Satellite Technology. Hello. Yeah, your audio is coming in through fine. Uh, I think someone okay. just muted their mic. So. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you about space domain awareness from a, a low cost small satellite perspective. Um, I'm going to talk at a, at a high level about the pros and cons of, of ground based and space based systems and then focus on uh, space based systems in particular. I'll compare and contrast the benefits of different space sensors and give an overview of, of two different low cost uh, SSTL, uh, SDL, uh, SDA satellites. Um, but, but, um, but first off, I'll, I'll say a few words about, um, about SSTL. So uh, SSTL is one of the world's leading uh, manufacturers of small satellites um, with over 40 years of, uh, of experience. Uh, we've flown um, in excess of, of 70 missions uh, and have cutting edge capability in Earth observation, communication and navigation, lunar and of course um, space domain awareness. And we're based in the UK and um, SSTL is part of uh, the Airbus group. So this slide just gives a quick overview of some of our recent uh, launches and, and just to pick some noteworthy missions uh, down in the bottom left with OTB-1, which was developed with General Atomics to fly NASA's Deep Space Atomic Clock. Um, bottom right is Quantum, a, a 3,000 kilogram fully software definable geo satellite, which we developed um, with Airbus. And uh, 
to topical, I would say. Uh, top right is Elsa D, developed for Astroscale, uh, which demonstrated successful um, docking in space. And um, we have also uh, recently been selected by ESA to develop the first commercial lunar comms uh, relay satellite, which will launch in 2024 and provide comms to ESA, NASA, and commercial uh, lunar orbiters, landers, and um, rovers. Hi, Clive. I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Todd from CASI headquarters. Do you see a little window on your on your screen that says uh, hide? You should see a hide link. Can we just yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just it was blocking some of your presentation. Yeah, I don't miss a thing. <laughs> okay, no problem. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, so the 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 um, the reckless, uh, I suppose, destruction of Cosmos fourteen oh eight by by a Russian anti satellite missile this week has uh, has clearly hit the headlines. Um, however, um, this last July was also the twenty sixth anniversary of a launch of an SSTL small sat called Cerise, which was a 50 kilogram LEO satellite built for SSTL for the French military. And in July 1996, the satellite experienced the first recorded collision between two catalogued objects with its six meter gravity boom um, being severed by a piece of debris from an Ariane uh, rocket upper stage. Um, so the satellite survived and was able to continue to operate with degraded performance. However, what was sad was the severed boom became yet another new object of, of debris in Earth orbit. So, um, so on, you know, on one hand, SSTL is, is focused on, um, on SDA, and on the other hand, we've actually kind of suffered the, uh, the, the consequences of, um, of being hit actually by, by, by debris. So, we need sensors to monitor space, and there are pros and cons of ground-based and space-based sensors. Ground-based optical systems typically require a network of, of sensors in different countries to compensate for atmospheric conditions, but are cost-effective. Um, ground-based radar is a powerful tool. However, radar can only see objects which are radar-reflective, and they can sometimes miss objects with a small radar cross-section and non-metallic objects. Space-based systems, on the other hand, have unique viewing opportunities and fill in the blind spots that ground systems can't see. However, they can be, of course, relatively expensive. From a defense perspective, it's useful to observe particular objects for a longer period of time in order to detect and predict changes and characterize them. And in that sense, space-based systems are useful. But the reality is that all systems have a valuable part to play in monitoring debris, and space-based systems fulfill a vital role in a comprehensive SDA system. So when we consider space-based systems, different detection technologies have trade-offs. Optical systems are impacted by solar illumination angle, but they're simple and require limited power. Panchromatic gives the best resolution, but multispectral can deliver additional information about debris. Space-based space radar has a number of advantages, as radar delivers range and velocity from a single measurement, but they require significant power, um, which often drives a requirement for a complex and often a, a particularly expensive spacecraft. So optical systems, are the most common in many ways as they deliver a good balance between a capability and a cost. So what is STL's heritage of uh, SDA missions? Well, in collaboration with MDA and ComDev, SSTL helped develop Sapphire for the Canadian D&D. As a platform developer for Sapphire mission, SSTL worked as a key supplier to Canadian industry to develop the satellite and therefore has a strong heritage in SDA. The LEO platform, along with a space control center and Canadian ground station was supplied by SSTL. SSTL also provides service level support for the mission. 
And of course, the mission has been a, a, a great success and still remains operational today and has given SSTL an excellent understanding of the requirements of an SDA mission. Sapphire's imager is around about 150 millimeter aperture and operates in a tracking mode, which gives it um, pointing and tracking stability. So it gives them a best sensitivity for, for an optical instrument uh, and enables it to detect dim objects. Um, SSTL developed uh, the Sapphire's high performance AOCS system to meet stringent pointing, tracking and stability requirements for the mission. Uh, and Sapphire has a visual magnitude of around 15, which corresponds to good precision in Leo and approximately, I think, 1.3 1 meters in, in, in geo at, at around 36,000 um, kilometers. So the knowledge and heritage of Sapphire has helped SSDL develop more recent proposals for um, LEO-based SDA small satellites. And the first of these is the um, SSTL micro-based um, satellite. This is a 120 kilogram satellite with a, a 300 millimeter um, optical uh, uh, instrument in terms of aperture. Um, the SSTL micro supports tracking mode and sampling mode. Um, as previously mentioned, tracking mode gives good sensitivity to objects but sampling mode is also useful for, to determine the volume of objects and assessing the kind of debris environment. With a visual magnitude of 16.5, um, the spacecraft delivers uh, very good um, precision in LEO and approximately um, 60 centimeters um, detection in, in, in GEO. And um, that leads on to um, our higher performance um, uh, spacecraft, which is uh, called the SSTL Mini Precision uh, Satellite, um, which is highly capable in, in terms of agility and detection sensitivity. It gives a, a really high fidelity system able to track um, some of the most difficult targets and, and deliver, deliver exquisite data. Um, the optical sensor has a, a 420 millimeter aperture, so it's it's a kind of step up in in, in size. And the spacecraft supports multiple modes: um, staring mode, which is useful to detect new objects; tracking mode gives really good sensitivity, and, and sampling mode gives gives a good way of determining the volume of objects. That's a magnitude um, over 18 visible magnitude um, and has very high fidelity at, at LEO and corresponds to around about 30 centimeters in, in GEO. Um, as a provision for cooling of a payload uh, via a passive radiator to further improve performance, has a high performance X-band downlink capability and it also has the potential for onboard processing and an a inter-satellite BGAN terminal to aid um, fast um, tracking. So using um, LEO satellites to observe the geostationary ring is, is a good compromise between the large light collecting abilities of ground-based systems and the detailed observations possible from, from near geo. Uh, the major benefit of LEO-based systems is that they deliver very rapid access to any point in the geostationary ring at a reasonable cost. And this simulation is a, is a visual, I suppose, reputation of a representation of a single uh, SDA satellite, satellite in a sun synchronous dawn to dusk orbit. Uh, the visible region uh, that the satellite can see is in blue. And the red square, which is probably very small on the screen, um, um, is, is the satellite um, moving in orbit. And the clear white area is the exclusion zone due to the sun and the Earth's shadow. And um, this simulation reflects a worst case scenario where both the sun and moon obscure the geo ring and the Earth's shadow also causes a further obstruction by uh, eclipsing a section of a ring. However, clearly the sun has the most significant impact. And what I show is that, that with a single satellite, only half the geo ring can be visible at any one moment as the satellite moves around the, um, around the Earth. 
But if you, um, uh, if you move to two satellites, so there's two tiny little red dots moving there, um, it delivers significantly better visibility of a georing with a much increased blue area. Um, so the conclusion here is that multiple satellites deliver benefits in coverage, resilience, and redundancy, and also can monitor several targets at once and increase the overall track capacity of a system. Two satellites enable the ability to track custody of key targets and assets and deliver a level of persistence which is, is useful, particularly to detect, say, nefarious actors. And of course, multiple satellites um, could lend themselves to international collaboration. And, and one, I suppose, could envisage a scenario where like-minded allies, for example, within the Five Eyes community, could co collaborate to develop an effective um, space-based um, system. So in conclusion, um, we need to improve the overall accuracy and quality of SDA data by harnessing the capability of, of all sensors, um, and particularly the capability of space-based sensors, as they, they complement ground-based systems. Optical-based small sats uh, are particularly useful um, addition because they're often cost-effective um, and deliver a good uh, level of, of uh, SDA capability. And also multiple satellites deliver enhanced performance and resilience and lend themselves um, to collaboration between like-minded allies. And thank you, that was, uh, that was the presentation. Thank you very much, Clive. That was very interesting. And uh, it's interesting to see the new uh, shapes of Surrey's uh, proposals for the new bus styles that could do optical uh, space situational awareness. I caught a couple of things during your presentation. You mentioned LEO a couple of times. Uh, do you mean LEO to LEO tracking? Uh, yeah, in, in, well, in, in the sense that we would see the, the satellites um, being located in LEO and, and, and then, um, yeah, potentially have I lost my screen sharing now I'm not sure yeah I think it's gone yeah um, so we would see them as as Leo based satellites with the ability to to look out um, you know beyond that potentially up to um, up to geo I see and uh, that's actually a pretty promising capability we've been finding that uh, it's actually fairly uh, straightforward to implement that uh, uh, we were doing it on Neosat for the last few years, and I'm pretty confident Sapphire could do it as well if we were able to make some changes on the software to do it. So uh, it's uh, a lot of the architecture is in place to do it already. It's just uh, it hasn't been done. So there's a bit of an area to open up there in order to do it. It certainly has its own unique uh, uh, constraints in terms of visibility, though. Uh, that's one of the mm -hmm. things that we found when uh, working in that area. Yeah, and and I think what 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 uh, I wanted to show in the presentation was that you know the, to show in a way as kind of stepwise possible kind of set of satellites that that that, that kind of build on Sapphire, Sapphire or enhance the performance of Sapphire. You know, the the the, the micro one being a first step and at, at a hundred and. Um, you know 120 kilograms kind of type of satellite with a 300 320 millimeter aperture and then moving out up to to something a little bit bigger you know above above 200 um kilograms and um yeah and su suffice to say you know having having been involved with comdev and mda um with sapphire which we're we're, we're very proud of on, on behalf of of, of canada um you know sda is one of the um you know continues to be one of the focus areas for, for for sstl moving forward and and of course we are we are very focused in 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 collaboration um with the uk government and also with the five eyes community um and um uh, and so we we would look and hopefully envisage you know uh, some some level of kind of international co collaboration um you know moving forward um particularly based on 
you know the quickening pace of 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 requirements um with you know the incident this week um you know adding further weight to that um that challenge uh, it certainly is and there's uh, uh, basically a growing environment uh, that needs to be addressed i'm just going through the questions on the um on the chat right now and um Hold one second here. I think some of these were referring to the previous presentation, but um, well, I th there's one here I think could apply. Um, what do you think of star trackers as opportunistic sensors for space domain awareness? Oof. Um, yeah, interesting question. Um, <laughs> Quite honestly, I am not sure. I would probably need to, to ask, go back to our my my team. But I mean, it seems quite a good concept. Um, but I don't have a, a, a strong qualified answer to that to that question. Um, an interesting I interesting angle, undoubtedly. I have uh, one here from uh, the Canadian Forces, um, uh, Jesse Dumont. I'm sorry, I don't know the rank because it doesn't show me in the uh, chat box here. Um, so there's right now there are currently many entities trying to develop a recognized space picture for different clients and users. What do you think, sh or who do you think should be responsible for SSA, commercial or military? Uh, yourself as a manufacturer, I think that's a little bit of a different question, but I was just curious what your thoughts on that were. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I think both both parts of of uh, uh, you know got a part to play, but I I mean. I, I think based on what's happened this week, I actually think that, and I think I, I, I think we can't avoid the fact that, you know, we see uh, an accelerating trend of a creation of, of space forces and space command. I mean, the UK um, space, um, space command, you know, was, was stood up this, um, this, this year and we see similar things happening around, uh, uh, around the world. So I think, uh, you know, both, both the civilian and the defense side has, has a part to play. Um, and, 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 and often the defense side has a, um, you know, a, uh, a, a, a strong focus in this area and often the you know the financial clout to um to to um to put in place capability and I, and i think as a as a commercial entity sstl is you know is is happy like i suppose all all, all commercial companies you know happy to to play our part um to provide innovative solutions to um to, to government agencies um you know be them the, the likes of ESA or nasa or um you know uh, uk space command or dnd whoever they are um or, or 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 to commercial entities wanting to find um you know a, a commercial an, a, angle to um to, to, to sda i mean we we were open to collaboration with with um you know, with, with with all actors, and we probably need all actors, just as we need, um, you know, international collaboration to um, to have uh, effective solutions to uh, to SDA. You're absolutely right, and uh, without those collaborations, uh, the network of sensors that uh, keeps custody of these objects uh, would really struggle. A single sensor by itself. Uh, can't do everything, and uh, and uh, the mesh of all of them together uh, certainly does uh, play a huge role in keeping custody of the objects that are on orbit. Um, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Clive for his presentation today. We'll need to press on to the next presentation. So thank you very much for your presentation there, Clive, and um, we're keen to keep uh, watch as to what the offerings are as they move forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Our next presenter today is Captain Shane Ryle, and uh, actually he works for Defence Research and Development Canada with me. And he, what he'll be presenting on today is the NEOSAT microsatellite on terms of what a single sensor can do in keeping custody of at least a national uh, cross-section of satellites in space. So his paper is titled Canadian Satellite Tracking or Tasking List Maintaining Canadian object custody with Neosat. Uh, Captain Ryle, uh, your 
welcome to take over and I'll go on mute. Hi there. Uh, yeah, okay. I'll, I guess I'll begin. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm just here to, as Waki said, to give a brief uh, explanation into a project that we've been working on uh, for the past year or so called the Canadian uh, Satellite Trasking, Trasking List, um, maintaining Canadian object custody with Neosat. Essentially, what we've been doing for the past year uh, is monitoring all the Canadian geo objects uh, that we're, Neosat is capable of observing to determine if Neosat is capable of maintaining custody of those objects in the future rather than relying on TLEs produced by the SSN um, and other, other sources where we could see if, if Neosat through periodic monitoring is capable of producing more accurate orbits uh, with less uh, time intensive uh, scheduling as well as using those orbits that it produces to queue itself to take more uh, to do more uh, imaging. Now, uh, the experiment's been going on for about a year so far, and there's three phases uh, of that experiment. The first one is the collection phase, which we've primarily been doing uh, up until then, where we're observing all the Canadian objects that Neosat is capable of observing uh, for the last year since October 2020, and then using those observations to improve observing strategies. Uh, as you'll see when I go on, there's uh, a lot of variance between the when we're observing certain objects that are Canadian active or inactive geos, and sometimes uh, one object only has like 50 observations, even though we're scheduling at the same level as every as other objects, which may have 300 observations. Now, there's a variety of reasons for that based on constraints and geometry and how bright the object is. But uh, we want to, in order to get more accurate orbits, we want to generally try and uh, optimize our observation methods to improve uh, a more consistent way of getting those objects. Uh, the next part is which I'm talking about today is the photometric characterization, kind of the halfway mark where we uh, have enough data over the past year to start producing light curves uh, to see how those objects are behaving that we've been monitoring, as well as um, showing, looking at the photometric data to see uh, for consistency and future scheduling to see how we can optimize that for producing accurate orbits. Now, the next part after uh, in the next couple of months is going to be the orbit estimation phase where we start producing these orbits and statistically comparing them uh, for their accuracy and determine if Neosat is capable of maintaining like the sole custody of these uh, CSTL objects uh, just through periodic uh, scheduling of these uh, 30 geos. And there's a few Leos. So this is the Canadian satellite tasking list. Essentially, it's a, a series of active, inactive geos and some Leos that Neosat is capable of monitoring. We have the Annex, the Telstars, the Nimix, CL, CTS, and uh, for Leos, we be able to monitor Alouette and Isis. Now, there's there's a lot of Leos like Kepler's and stuff that uh, Neosat were not included in this uh, survey, partially because uh, it's more tricky for Neosat to get imaging of a few of these objects below uh, above a certain speed, and um, as well as objects below a certain magnitude. Uh, the, we're using Neosat, a DRDC-owned research satellite, which uh, has a 15-centimeter light CCD telescope, and as well as uh, with a field of view of 0 0.8 degrees uh, and an operational altitude of 785 kilometers. Now, we've limited what we've been monitoring to above 900 kilometers, and that kind of corresponds to the being, above, being below the max speed of 220 arc seconds a second and being above the minimum magnitude of 16 points. Now. As for Neosat, for those who are unaware, uh, Neosat operates uh, in low Earth orbit. Uh, as you can see from this small red orbit close to the Earth here, uh, it's able to take uh, geos in its field, of, uh, images in its field of view, um, and it, it images geos quite well. And we've been staying out of the solar exclusion region, uh, so that gives us light curves that are around uh, plus 150 to negative 150 phase angle, and we kind of stay within that range uh, and as you'll see on the light curves later, that uh, that allows us to gain a ac somewhat accurate representation of the geos that are uh, going around the Earth. Now, this is what an image from Neosat looks like. Uh, we take it in track rate mode, which means that we uh, slew Neosat's camera uh, along the same rate as the satellites are passing over us. So they look like point sources, as you can see from ANIC G1, ANIC F1, and Echo Star 17. And, uh, this allows us to get a better representation of those satellites rather than uh, if they were displayed as streaks 
uh, if Neosat was uh, stationary. And the streaks you see on the image are the stars that are passing by at uh, the speed that Neosat is slewing. We use a uh, squid three, which is an in-house algorithm to kind of uh, centroid and match filter, apply algorithms to these streaks to try and do asymmetric uh, location to determine where these satellites are in space, as well as extract photometric data from all these satellites. Uh, now, our observing strategy has basically been to uh, attempt one to three tracks per object per time slot. Normally, we well, we share Neosat with the CSA, the uh, the scheduling time. So Neos a CSA is conducting their own astrometry, astron astronomy experiment uh, alongside DRDC's Kios mission. And so the Neosat time is split, and CSTL is further split to one quarter of the total viewing time. So we were limited within around 12 to 24 hour time spans every couple of days to try and get these 32 objects. Now, the 12 hours was usually sufficient to measure the, the 27 geos, but uh, the leos were more tricky because we don't always have access to uh, seeing them during those time periods. Uh, we tried to attempt to maintain similar number of observations for each object uh, because we want to uh, try and standardize our measurements. Uh, if some of the objects have like 20 tracks, as you'll see on the next slide, and some have 300, then the uh, quality of the data is going to be varied widely. But there is a lot of factors that go into how many observations we can get. Uh, our results after the year were 3,830 3, total observations. Uh, we had, let's just say, 32 satellites. And there were 65 LEO observations. That was started late, but still it's harder to obtain those LEO observations with Neosat than the GEOs. As you can see, there was uh, 831 inactive GEO observations and 2,934 active GEO observations. Uh, this is basically the list of uh, observations we got from each satellite. As you can see from the red arrows, now like the classes of object that we were measuring, it had a big variation in how many observations we could get, but also within that class, there was a large variation. As you can see from the ANIC A1s, they have uh, around less than 20 observations each over the entire year, whereas some of these have other inactive ones of 150, and the, some of the active ones even range from 100 to 300 observations, which uh, shows that Although we were scheduling them without any bias towards any certain satellites, and we we're putting the full list of objects into our automated scheduler each time, uh, these the observations that came out of that were very, very, uh, very strongly towards certain satellites, such as ANIC G1 and Telstar 12V. Uh, we made a few data adjustments before the light curves, basically changing all the phase angles of the active geos to uh, equatorial phase angle. Uh, just to reduce the third dimensional element from the phase angle uh, and apply them all around the equator uh, to re remove Neosat's north-south viewing angle, which uh, had an issue where when we reduced light curves, you know, we wouldn't see any magnitudes around the zero phase angle, and this kind of fixes that issue. Uh, we normalized all the magnitudes for range at 40,000 kilometers for geo, 1,000 for LEO. Uh, and we used Neosat's zero point, which was calculated uh, just uh, based on Neosat's equipment rather than uh, using any calculations. Uh, and then we applied a Gaussian curve fit to all these just to kind of determine if there are any patterns we could dis discern from these uh, geo objects. Uh, this is our representative curve. Uh, this is probably the cleanest curve that we had from the data, which is ANIC F1R. Uh, as you can see, it's a normal, uh, it's a standard Gaussian distribution, similar to normal normal chart. Uh, we noticed a few characteristics that were similar along all or not, most of the active geos, which were like an average magnitude range of about four, four magnitude, uh, ranging around from around 10 to 14 from the peak to the valley. They all had around uh, an average morning and dusk magnitude at plus and minus 90 degrees, phase angle of around uh, 9 to 11 magnitude or 13 magnitude. Uh, and they all had a roughly symmetrical curve. Now, there were some exceptions, which you'll see in the upcoming curves, where uh, they were not symmetrical. This kind of indicates uh, that there's a deeper picture going on that Neosat is unable to determine, and we can't really determine that behavior from just light curves. Um, and they all had a relatively low solar panel offset. Now, this standard pattern indicates that they're, the solar panels were tracking the sun, so like the highest um, the brightest magnitude occurred at zero degrees phase angle, and the lowest magnitude occurred as we got out of the range of Neosat uh, towards the 180 uh, plus or minus 180 phase angle range. Uh, they, the 
there were some where there was a lot of uh, outliers and stuff going on, but it's hard to, Neoset has a level of uncertainty when you're imaging these things that can only pick up stuff that is greater than 16 magnitude. And uh, there's in the residual effect, uh, there is some magnitude of uncertainty that goes along with these charts that limit in how much behavior and geometry uh, interpretation, interpolation we can get from these charts. Uh, this is a uh, viewing of an inactive geo. Basically, they, all the inactive geos were just randomly distributed data points. They're spinning through space. Uh, they do not have much, uh, they're not being maintained, and they all appear to be randomly distributed around a specified magnitude range. Now, this one was relatively flat. We have some other ones, like Anik E1, which has, due to its geometry, uh, gives a different light curve. And while there isn't much consistency between the inactive geos because the geometry and the illumination geometry and how Neosa can view them gives wildly different distributions, but there's no point curving this uh, because it's basically just tumbling randomly uh, through space. Uh, now, we didn't get much LEO observations uh, just due to Neosat's access ability and um, and we started monitoring the LEOs about halfway through the year rather than the full year. And so there's, but these are all in Alouettes and ISIS are all inactive LEOs. So we kind of uh, expected that even if we had more data points, it would kind of look like a random distribution similar, ex similar to the inactive geos, but just at a higher uh, brightness. As you can see, it's like four to eight rather than uh, nine to 12. Now there's a few more interesting light curves that we, we picked up. One was Anik F1, which was a relatively flat curve. It didn't really meet the uh, expected Gaussian distribution uh, that we had for all the other light curves. Uh, this is due to the, the Anik F1 actually has uh, solar ray concentrators attached to solar rays. And um, they, they had a fogging issue with uh, the Anik F1. So it doesn't track as well. Um, that being said, Neosat is not uh, sensitive enough to pick up any uh, more distinct changes within the light curve. Uh, I've seen light curves on Anik F1 from other uh, uh, other papers where there is like sort of an oscillating pattern going on, which Neosat is outside the sensitivity to detect, to detect that. But this kind of indicates that there's further behavioral changes that could be investigated for this. Uh, same with Anik G1, which kind of indicates like there was an solar panel offset of around 50 degrees in phase angle. Um, this also would warrant uh, further investigation uh, for the active geo, which kind of suggests that it would be, there is behavioral or uh, illumination geometry effects going on that is not being able to detect by Neosat. Uh, Anik E1 is interesting because uh, while it is an active geo, it kind of flares up around the edges. Uh, there's a huge variance, variance in magnitude of eight points uh, around the edges of like 150 phase angle. And this kind of shows that uh, we kind of, this is kind of based on the uh, the geometry of the satellite and the illumination geometry that is gonna be monitored for a while, but it's very interesting to see based on how the object is spinning erratically and how it's shaped that it produces even ones that are totally unmaintained and inactive can produce radically different uh, light curves just based on their orientation uh, of the spin and uh, design in space. Uh, now, the key findings, we essentially found that most Canadian active geologics roughly followed the expected Gaussian distribution pattern with respect to the phase angle. Uh, it was kind of predicted that most photometric light curves from Neosat cannot be determined, used to determine behavior and geometry, uh, that, apart from the active geo objects, which uh, given that they had a relatively similar pattern, we could kind of determine that they're tracking the sun, they're using the solar panels to track the sun as well as other behavioral effects. But that being said, just from the data points alone, you can't tell if it's uh, what, what exactly is going on on a very smaller level, especially over data points ranging a year. Uh, the LEO and inactive geo objects light curves did not have much discernible pattern uh, as expected because uh, comparing the light curves of magnitude versus phase angle is really the best used for active geos that are being maintained where there's a clearly intentional pattern going on with the, the light curves. Uh, the magnitudes range from nine to 12 for geo and six to eight for LEO objects, which is somewhat expected that LEOs would be much brighter as they're closer to Neosat and closer to the Earth, as well as there was a level of uncertainty for the residuals compared to the curve fit. So some objects had uh, a high level uh, of root mean square and deviation from the, uh, the light curve. And Neosat uh, is, sensors are not as sensitive as they could be or a ground-based sensor could be. So uh, there was some 
uh, subtleties in the light curves that could not be detected from NeoSat. And certain objects were able to be imaged at a much, much higher rate than others due to dimness in the uh, the light curves as well, or dimness in the object as well as uh, NeoSat's access and various other uh, limitations and constraints imposed by NeoSat as well as the, the satellites we we're trying to monitor. Uh, so the next steps for this, this project uh, is we're going to continue collecting observations and prioritizing the ones that have low observations and improve the imaging techniques of NeoSat. But the, the real intention of the project was to, uh, in the future, if NeoSat is capable of producing these accurate orbits more so than the SSN, is to use those TLEs to queue NeoSat itself with the, and be uh, maintain custody within Canada of Canadian objects, rather than like sharing the reliance with the, the, the US and Five Eyes nations is good, but uh, this would also give us more capabilities within Canada to monitor our own objects, uh, even with a low amount of uh, a low amount of periodic tracking of these objects. And uh, so that's uh, that's what I have for that. But I'm going to show you a few of the light curves that we uh, we were able to produce from these uh, Canadian objects. Uh, as you can see, like there's a lot of variation between the uh, inactive objects, the ones without the the curve fitting, but the curve fitting relatively, it had this similar pattern for all of them, which a few variations. Some of these are varying based on uh, the limitation on how much observations were even able to be uh, observed from them, as well as uh, some outliers, either maneuvers or uh, something else going on that can't be picked up by NeoSat. But we were able to somewhat, we'll continue getting observations and continue to apply this uh, these strategies and try and see how the accuracy turns out when we start creating these orbits and comparing them against uh, the other way we get the TLEs. And that's pretty much all I had to say on uh, this experiment, uh, if there's any questions on that. Thank you very much, Shane. So that was, that was well done and uh, very keen to see the results. Now, the uh, I don't see any questions in the box right now, but I have, uh, I'm going to take um, uh, uh, supervisor's privilege here and put the questions to you. So, um, so I guess uh, the big differentiation that we see in your results is that a dead satellite out in GEO uh, has that flat looking light curve, but an active one has that nice Gaussian shape that we generally see. So um, that's more or less what's happening so what does the residuals and magnitude around those flatter looking dead satellites telling us um i'm not 100 percent sure uh on some of them but i would su say that the residuals and magnitude suggest that uh some of them suggest the i guess the rate it was spinning and what geometry the solar panels would be uh located at uh determining like if they had certain certain geometry and certain ways they were spinning, then it would uh, cause more residuals based on the illumination. But that being said, I'm not I'm not 100% uh, sure based on this uh, based on these these charts what what behavior they could be telling us. Although I can look into that for you. So the uh, so in Anaki 2's example there, we see those interesting behaviors at high phase angle where it actually flashes in brightness pretty intently. And um, whereas at the smaller phase angles, it actually tends to be much more muted. So we actually see that fairly often, even from the ground, not just from space-based sensors. So, and what that is, is it's a, an effect where, it's an effect where your line of sight to the target and the illuminator basically create a very, very, very small range to which the object can flash. And when it does, you're seeing a very, very high angle glint, which tend to be very bright. So that's what causes them. So um, anyways, and we use that to basically as a fingerprint to say whether or not a satellite is alive or dead. If you have that nice Gaussian shape over that 12 hour period or more that we tend to track them, that's an active satellite. And that's exactly what you were seeing in your results. And when they're flat and those residuals are there uh, around that flat curve over, over a phase angle, it's a, it's a very strong indicator that the object is dead but tumbling but we don't have enough time resolution on NeoSat to really find that nice varying time varying detail. If you took images once every second on Anik E2, you'll see it's rotating both once every 20, 25 seconds or so. It's actually really spinning out there. So there's a lot of uh, dynamics that's happening very, very quickly behind the scenes that we can't quite see. 
Um, you had a slide too. I was wondering if you can pop your slides back up for a second. And I just wanted to put a question to you. You had a, you, it's the image of the satellites themselves taken by Neosat. Just wonder if you can pop that back up for a second. Yeah, let me pull that up. Are you able to see the slide? Yep, and just go to the image. Thank you. On the lower right, you have CR hits. What does that mean? Um, I'm not sure. I didn't make this uh, this image. I got this image from uh, Stefan, uh, another researcher, to uh, uh, just as a representative uh, image of how uh, Neosat takes takes the uh, satellite images. But this wasn't one of the images used by uh, the CSTL project. So they, they're actually cosmic ray or charged particle strikes on the imager there. So just to differentiate what exactly they are, because sometimes they look very much like a, uh, a satellite when you're uh, taking an image on, um, when you're taking an image in space, radiation is uh, is not your friend. And they provoke those little events. You don't see it on ground-based sensors, but in space, we get hit by it all the time. And we have to use filtering algorithms to watch for those events. There's a question from, uh, from the chat here. And what aspect of Neosat's hardware or software limits further characterization of the light curves and geometry? Um, well, one of the limitations was a malfunction that Neosat suffered a couple of years ago, uh, in, not allowing Neosat to, uh, I think it was in the reaction wheel, correct me if I'm wrong, Lucky, uh, there, there was a malfunction on Neosat where they, it limits how how many images can be taken in a certain period of time without desaturating the the, uh, the satellite and having a rest period, which uh, limits how many images we can take in a certain period of time. There was also the constraint of uh, having to share Neosat with other uh, with the CSA and having time constraints, as well as the limited magnitude on how dim objects Neosat can view. There are a few objects, such as the Anik A1s, which you could see they have, uh, sorry, I closed the screen, but the Anik A1s all had, A1, A2, and A3, all had less than 20 observations over the whole year. And that was partially because they were too dim to be picked up by Neosat, uh, just the sensor. And that, uh, that could have been uh, better picked up by, through a ground-based, uh, sensor, but Neosat was unable to pick up a lot of those uh, ANIC A's for that reason, which uh, due to like the technological constraints of Neosat. Uh, there was not There was also the question of uh, the how accurate the data that Neosat, uh, magnitude data that Neosat was collecting was, um, which was called into question on the ANIC F1 curve, the, the curve that was more flat, uh, given the, the level of like uh, ac how precise the uh, the data is that Neosat and how what the residual uh, the uh, like deviation between the data Neosat collects and the data displayed uh, detect and the actual data of that satellite uh, would lead to a big difference in the actual light curve uh, just based on uh, Neosat's limitations on how how accurate it can pick up the magnitudes. To what uh, degree of uh, degree of accuracy? Uh, thank you, the, there, Shane. The um, one little nuance there: the a ground-based observer is fixed on the ground, and the target geo satellite's declination is relatively constant throughout the night. Neosat, while it's orbiting the Earth, has a constantly changing declination view of its target, and that's what tends to create those uh, variations in brightness that we tend to see from orbit. And so and there's still a bit of work going on going right now to mitigate those in order to compare it to a ground-based sensor. So that's, and it, you, you more or less hit it at the park. There's just a, a couple of nuances there. OK, I think that's uh, pretty much it for the um, for the talk for the talks today, I uh, just wanted to thank um, um, Captain uh, Rael and certainly the other presenters, uh, Clive and uh, and Stefan, for their presentations today. 
Um, I would like to just remind everyone that if you have the opportunity to prepare a paper for uh, Cassie Astro, it will be considered for the CASJ journal. And if you are preparing a paper, um, certainly for the SSA uh, session, please let me know and I'll uh, certainly try to encourage and um, shepherd it along for uh, publication uh, within CASJ if you're willing to take it through peer review and so forth. So I encourage you to do that. It's a very important thing to do in the field of space situational awareness. Uh, we tend to look out into space quite often, but we forget to write about it. So anyways, it's actually very important to do that and uh, and uh, to basically document the great work that Canada is doing in this area. Uh, before we close out, I just wanted to make a reminder to tomorrow there is a space domain awareness workshop uh, that's going to be hosted by Cassie and DRDC. It's going to focus, well, it's going to be focusing on two main questions. Uh, it's going to talk about, uh, uh, about responsible behaviors in space. And I think certainly after the events of this week, it's uh, a question that a lot of people are currently asking nowadays. And we're also going to be having a quick discussion about um, the the upcoming CANSPOC Canadian Defence Civil and Commercial Integration Cell, where uh, Canadian space data, tra uh, SSA data, or even space weather data can be merged and provided to the government of Canada or to other users. So there's uh, going to be a bit of a discussion and pooling of the public around that around that tomorrow. There will be briefings at the start of the uh, discussion that will be provided by government and uh, some other, uh, and uh, actually a nonprofit uh, organization talking about uh, how, uh, what kind of projects that Canada is undertaking, where it is going, and, uh, and the type of problem that we're trying to quantify right now. Um, the session tomorrow will start at 12 o'clock, and as a registrant with uh, the uh, Astro 2021 conference, you are certainly welcome to join in for free. And if you're not a registrant for Cassie Astro, you can certainly register independently. If you know colleagues that want to join separately, they're absolutely uh, welcome to do so, and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, at the courtesy of uh, Defence R&D Canada. So that's uh, pretty much uh, a wrap up for today. I would really like to thank everyone for the uh, for the for the time today, and certainly thank Cassie for hosting uh, this uh, technical session. And I think we can wrap it up there. So thank you very much. Have a pleasant week, and keep your lights out at night. Bye bye. Uh, Victor, uh, Todd, I think we can uh, shut down now. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And thank you to the audience for their attendance today and uh, appreciate your uh, feedback.